Hello everybody, Kelly Rice here, but I write under the pen name K.M. Rice. And welcome to my author vlog, and also welcome to 2019! <laughs> You've obviously been in it for a few weeks now, but this is the first episode of 2019. And I would like to begin by thanking all of my viewers, and by thanking especially my patrons on Patreon. You guys are awesome, and you have been with me for years now, some of you, and I just want you all to know that I'm so very thankful for you. So, I also have an announcement. This year, because I've been doing this vlog for a couple years now, more than a couple, because couple means two, um, this year I am going to be branching out and not only discussing writing topics, which I still will do, and I'll still be fielding your questions, uh, but I also want to discuss some issues that are important to me and maybe even some stuff going on in my life because after all it is a vlog. It's not just a writing advice venue, which is how I've kind of been treating it for a while. Um, so I'm excited by this new possibility and as always if there's something you'd like me to discuss leave it in the comments and it might just happen. <laughs> so today's topic is feminism. And I thought I would start by defining what that word means to me. To me, feminism means equality between the sexes. It doesn't mean I am anti-man, or that I hate men, or anything like that. Um, I'm a heterosexual person. I freaking love men. Just let that sink in because it amused me. <laughs> but um, yes, to me, feminism and what it should be uh, is just about equality. That said, um, equality in terms of equal opportunity. Um, that said, there are inherent differences between men and women. Um, and those do influence our decisions and how we are treated and how we are perceived. But um, Basically, it is the movement of striving towards a level playing field, or at least as level as we can make it, given our inherent differences. I was raised in a relatively feminist household. My mother was part of the women's lib movement, and by the time I was five years old, I was taught to call out my brother on his behavior that was sexist. It was the biggest word I knew at the time. Uh, I didn't truly know what it meant. All I knew was that if he told me, you can't do that, you're a girl, you can't come over here, you're a girl, we can't play that game because you're a girl, whenever that was thrown at me, I could just shout, Mom, he's being sexist. And she would ask me to say, tell her what it was that he did or said, and he'd be called out for it. So it was kind of like <laughs> my little weapon. Um, even though I didn't have any true, how could you at that age, I didn't have any true understanding of what that word meant in all of its facets. Um, but now I do. <laughs> now that I'm older. Maybe a little wiser, I don't know, my five-year-old self probably uh, probably peaked in some ways back then. But I'm digressing. So, I was fortunate to be raised in that, uh, with knowing that dis difference. Because, for example, it equipped me when, um, we had a neighbor up the hill who he had grandsons and they loved to torment me just for being female and they would do things like go into my tree house and lock the door and push me out and not let me in and say you can't come in no girls allowed no girls allowed boys only um my brother older brother when he was playing with his friends and this is a normal kid thing i was the annoying young younger sibling i was off actively excluded all the time for being a girl. Um, and going back to the neighbors, I once had a fort and they came and destroyed it. And they never said anything to my face, but they came and tore the whole thing apart and broke everything. It wasn't quite like <laughs> the Netflix series, Anne with an E. It wasn't quite like what happened to Anne, sorry if that's a spoiler, but it was a similar thing. So, you know, we all deal with bullies and we all deal with this stuff as we're growing up. At least, I think we all do. <laughs> and, um, 
but it gave me my mom teaching me that um you know i think there's two sides of feminism i think that there's one the world that we wish we lived in where people weren't discriminated based on their gender um and then there's the world as it is and my mom was on that side where she's like look kid you're bored a girl doesn't mean you're any less in any way but it means you're going to be treated differently and it means that people are going to say that to you as if it's a bad thing by the time i was in sixth grade there was you know kind of like this is it the third wave of feminism that was going on in like the late 90s um i remember i got a shirt it was i was finally at the age where i kind of was interested in going shopping kind of which i know that's a cracker because it's such like a girly thing um, and I remember picking out this shirt that said, yeah, I throw like a girl, I run like a girl, I punch like a girl because girls kick butt. And I was like, I want this shirt, man. And I got it and I wore it and so many of the other girls in my class were like, where'd you get that shirt? I want that shirt. One girl even said, I'm going to beat you up and steal that shirt one day. Like, <laughs> they loved it. So it was cool to see, even at that age, kind of a rallying cry to my fellow women. Um, because you are constantly told, you can't throw, you're a girl, you can't do this, you're a girl, you know, whatever it is. <sighs> My older brother figured that out very quickly and he weaponized it. And he found out that if he said anything, like, you can't do that, you're a girl, a man has to do that, um, then I would do it. So he started using it to manipulate me and like, you can't clean the pool, you can't vacuum the pool, you're a girl, it'd be too hard for you. Oh yeah? I'll show you and I'm out there for another hour and a half in the blazing sun vacuuming the pool when he was supposed to be doing it and he's just like hey. so <laughs> you know it, it, it when it became this defiant streak in me I was exploited a little um, so yes I was lucky to grow up in, in a somewhat enlightened environment and to know that this is a thing and it's not real you know to be warned at a young age that when people treat you differently that's their problem not yours and that you can stand up for yourself and you should stand up for yourself as opposed to maybe being raised in a household where just maybe the mom um isn't as aware and when her daughter faces these things um you know she thinks oh well maybe i am less because i am a girl or maybe i can't do that because i'm a girl or etc so i'm very thankful for that and i know that that has helped shape who i am and um so as i got older i of course encountered more and more roadblocks when i was a young teen and i'm talking like 13 14 i um, had my heart set on being a film director and i immediately saw <laughs> that's not a realm for women it's getting better now but back then it certainly wasn't there were no examples at all I loved the film Titanic and I remember watching James Cameron win his Oscar and I thought I want to be like him and this is actually also part of my journey as a storyteller as well because what was so appealing to me about James Cameron's Titanic was the fact that he told his method he said I wanted to tell the story of the Titanic but no one's gonna care about a hunk of metal sinking in the Atlantic and all these people dying unless you have an emotional attachment so he created Jack and Rose in their love story to get the audience to emotionally invest in um, in the tragedy and as a child you know because I'm I think I'm old enough now that I think everyone's a kid like people in their early 20s I'm like look at those kids and people are like they're not they're over 18 I'm like whatever they're still kids to me but as a kid as a child back then um, that was magic to me because that it had moved me that way you know I was in that perfect age group um, and it's funny now because I saw Titanic like three times in the movie theater which was a ton because we never got to go to the movies because it's expensive you know and um, then when I rewatched it as an adult in my 20s and I hadn't seen it for a long time I was like oh my gosh what a great film to be an influence on me because of Rose's character. Rose is a character who stands up to the conventions of her time and she has agency, she's willing to do things. Yes, it's all for a boy and all for love, but let's forget about that part right now because that's something I don't agree with. There's a lot of backlash against love stories and about women doing things for men and that that's not feminist and not okay and I disagree, but again, I'm a heterosexual woman and I think that love is one of the most powerful forces. All kinds of love, 
We need more words in our language to convey this complicated and many-faceted emotion. But um, if we're just looking at romantic love, I think there's nothing wrong with that being a motivator. Um, so, I don't believe that Rose should be throwing criticism for that. The whole, like, you know, can she go in the door with him thing? Can he go in the door? That's up for debate. But, <laughs> but I was struck as an older person watching that film, and I was glad that that was one of my governing influences when I was growing up and kind of finding where my passions laid and where where my expression was most apt to come out. Um, so that was a good thing. And I would say that that helped on my like feminist journey because of the positive example. And I remember there was a quote from James Cameron as well that they asked, where did you get, where do you get your inspiration for these strong women, these characters that you write? Because obviously he's not female. Uh, and his answer was the women of the world. And I remember latching onto that and loving it. And I know I did a whole video about why I don't like the phrase strong female characters. Um, and I still don't like that phrase because as I outlined in that video, the assumption in that phrase is that woman on its own is inherently not strong. So you have to quantify it with strong, which I disagree with. Um, but it's still used everywhere in the media. You never see like gladiators about a strong male lead who gets his revenge and fights in gladiator matches and blah blah blah. Like that's that's not a thing. So again, equality. Like why does it have to be a thing? And when we're talking about equality, I won't go too far down this <laughs> down this line. But um, the draft, for example, I think women should also be drafted. Uh, if you don't want us in combat, then there are plenty of non-combat jobs that women can do. So. That's just, you know, like I said, I won't go too far there in, in all the different societal ways that, you know, we should be equal. But that's something that people like to throw at feminists that, that like, well, then you should be serving in the military, you should be doing this if you want everything to be equal. And it's like, I agree, you know? Um, whether I <laughs> agree with the idea of a draft overall is a different subject. But anyway, this brings me to my 20s. There is still in existence, um, a blog called Feministing. I don't remember how I first encountered it, but when I did, I became hooked on reading the material. Some of it I disagreed with, some of it was too far, I don't want to say too far left, but too far in the vein of accept everything and I just, I can't agree with that. If there's something that's harmful, I, I have trouble accepting it, you know, um, as a positive. <laughs> but there's kind of that side of, and I will say left because I think it is more a more leftist movement than right, of um, accept everything in every shape, size, color, flavor, orientation, whatever, which for the most part, I agree with that. Like, live and let live. People aren't hurting themselves or each other. Um, you know, just let it be. But when it's like, I smoke and I do drugs and that's just how I cope, and then people are like, oh, more power to you, cope, you know, then it's like, um, hmm, well, there's also healthier ways you can do that. <laughs> so I'm not sure about, like, you know, being all psyched about it. <laughs> but I, I loved reading this blog, and from what I recall, I would look at it every night. Um, it took me forever to get a smartphone, so this would have just been on, like, my laptop when I should have been sleeping and not looking at a blue light. Um, college was weird. But, <laughs> but when I was doing that, um, I was getting very educated in the current events, what was going on, what was out there, and, uh, it was very empowering, and it was also very, um, eye-opening. The, the women who ran that vlog were the Valenti sisters, um, Jessica and, oh dear, I'm blanking on the other woman's name, but they're both, their last name is um, Valenti. This is one of her books. Um, her bio in the back says, Jessica Valenti is the founder and executive editor of Feministine.com and the author of Full Frontal Feminism, A Young Woman's Guide to Why Feminism Matters. Um, she also wrote, she's written several books. One is Yes Means Yes. Um, uh, another is The Purity Myth. 
at the time I asked for all of these books for my birthday. Ultimately, unfortunately, this is the only one that I actually read. And as you can guess from the title, it's about double standards in our society. This book is probably a decade old by now. Let me see, when was this published? 2008, yeah, so it's a decade, over, just over a decade old. But it's, you know, it's still pertinent. Here's an example of some of the du double standards. Double standards are nothing new. Women deal with them every day. Consider the following examples. He's a hipster, she's a hoe. He's gay, she's a fantasy. He's angry, she's PMSing. He's independent, she's pathetic. He's successful, she's a show-off. He's dating a younger woman, she's a cougar. Uh, women are held to different standard, a different standard than men, and mostly we just put up with it, but we don't have to. Jessica Valenti offers 50 solutions to 50 of the most pressing double standards that women confront. With sass, humor, and in-your-face facts, she informs and equips women with the tools they need to combat sexist comments, topple ridiculous stereotypes, and end the promotion of insidious double standards. So I went through a phase where I'm like, oh my god, yes! Like, um... He's, heteros he's metrosexual, she's anorexic, sorry, I got distracted. He's well paid, she's screwed. Don't get that one, actually. Um... Yeah, so, so I went through a phase where I bought this book for many young women in my life and I gave it to them for, you know, their birthdays because I felt like, not forewarmed is forearmed necessarily in this instance, but knowledge, knowledge is power. <laughs> and the more you know, the more you're self-aware, um, the better your quality of life will be and hopefully the quality of life of the people around you. Like I said, my mom was self-aware of gender <laughs> and um or at least aware of gender you know and taught that to me like like I outlined at the beginning of this so I felt like it was important because I was watching my little sister grow up in a world where she's like you know facing these double standard judgments and I would explain to her like that's not okay that's not fair and it's not true um you know so it was it was important to me to try to have that influence um, I got to a point where I was very fiery and very feisty. Um, it's like, you know how people say, once you see something, you can't unsee it, you can't unhear it, you can't unknow it. I was at this awakening and I was pissed because I was like, why? Why is the world like this? Why do I have to face these double standards? For example, um, I started winning screenwriting contests left and right when I was, I suppose this was during my transition into grad school because I went straight into grad school after college. Um, and there were rumors going around about me that the only reason, now granted I did not date in college, that's a fun fact, even grad school I didn't date. Now grad school I finished by the time I was, well I started when I was 23 because I went straight in so I was still relatively young but I was so focused on my studies that like mm, there were there were boys here and there, there were flirtations, there were like you know little things on the side but I didn't have a full on serious relationship with anyone in college. Yet these rumors about me, I'm just, I'm, I'm stating that fact because I find it ironic. Um, that I was sleeping with apparently everyone and that that's how I was winning these awards. Um, and these stories were largely spread by other males. And I don't, I don't want to say that was hurtful for me to hear, but it made me mad <laughs> and it made me laugh for the reason I just explained. Like really? Wow. Okay. I am so not that person, but you decided to paint me as that person to explain your own failures, your own, you know, I'm not saying, if you lose a contest, you're not a failure. If they were competing against me in these contests, contests and they failed, they are, okay, not they failed, they didn't win first place, doesn't mean you're a failure. Even just finishing a screenplay, submitting it to a contest, that's amazing, that's awesome, like you're not a freaking failure. But the fact that they felt the need to attack me, attack me, and attack me with the oldest, you know, stigma in the, in the world, she's a slut, that's how she got where she wanted, she's sleeping around. Um, not cool, and knee-jerk, and you ain't woke to use a modern expression. But um, 
so you know that's that's something that I went through in college and that was part of like my angry years and one of my best friends at the time was uh, a guy named Matt and he kind of like my brother very quickly learned I can push her buttons with this feminist stuff and so he for the sake of argument you know would come up with all these outlandish sexist things just to see me get all riled up and he'd be like, well, what's wrong with just, you know, your ambition only being to be in the kitchen and make kids and all that stuff? And I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with it, but that shouldn't be the expectation of all women because not all women want that. If you want that, that's great. Pursue it. If you don't, though, that shouldn't be placed on you. And he would just be like, <laughs> you know, provoking me. And I remember one time I finally came up talking about self-awareness. I finally was like, oh my God, he's doing this on purpose. And I was like, why? Why? Because this, this is the guy who, more power to him, one day he was cold and I said, do you want my jacket? And he was like, yeah, please, can I have your jacket? I give him my girly zip up hoodie and he happened to tag along with me to go meet one of my professors for a meeting talking about one of my screenplays. They'd never met each other and he just sat down in this tight little woman's <laughs> zip up jacket. So obviously he was someone very comfortable in like his own skin and wasn't, you know, like, he got it. He understood feminism. He wasn't, um, you know, there, there, he, you know, that was his defense. He's like, look, I just did, like, the most unmacho thing. I asked a girl for a coat. Um, but he just, he couldn't resist that needling. But I'm glad he did that needling, because that's what made me stop. And I think he pointed out, he's like, I do it because it pisses you off. Like, I do it because it makes you angry, and it's amusing, it's funny. Now, like, people getting humor or pleasure out of other people's frustration or anger, whatever, that's a different issue. But to him it was funny. And, um, but that made me, I remember it was like I kind of hit a wall in my mind and I was like, he's right. It's not that I just go, oh, okay, I've got, I've got a lot of ammo for this discussion. Let's have this discussion. I've had it before. I can have this with you. It wasn't that. It was literally, it made me angry. And that's when I stopped and realized Every time I read this blog, every time I read these feminist articles, not every time, but I get kind of triggered. Like, I get pissed off. And I don't want to be pissed off all the time. I don't want to be angry all the time. And once I had that realization, I started scaling back. And I was like, you don't have to look at it every day. There isn't a battle that you're going to win every day. You're not going to change people's lives or their mindsets every day. And in fact, you probably aren't at all online. Let's be real here, po folks. Like, if there's nothing else that we learned from the 2016 election, it's that these social media battles over who's the best candidate do not change anyone's opinion. In fact, they probably just further entrench people in the beliefs that they entered the discussion with. So that, that was my realization of that is not going to help the problem. But I can make changes in my life that in my little way, in my little sphere of influence can make my life easier and a more fair and equal place and for the people around me. So one of the things that I did, and a lot of women around me have done this, and I don't think that they all read this book, I don't think that this wasn't even an, a, a discussion that we had and decided, um, but I do not use the word bitch for other women. I don't use shaming words. I don't use slut, I don't use whore, I don't use ho, ho bag, like, you know, and, and in the past when I did use those words, it was usually like comedic. Or sometimes I was falling into the trap of like, she's sleeping with another guy, what a ho. Like that chick's a ho, you should avoid her or whatever. Because, you know, born into this society, you're part of it. Um, and it takes some work to go against the grain and against the current. And, um, until I, you know, through through exposing myself to more feminism, I'm like, so what if she's promiscuous? She can be promiscuous. She wants to be promiscuous. Those are her life, her body, her choices, just like a dude, you know? Like, oh, he's a stud, because, you know, title of the book, he's a stud, because, like, he got all these chicks, and, like, nobody thinks anything of it. Why? Because he doesn't have the repercussion of himself getting pregnant. Well, he could get someone else pregnant. He could be spreading disease just as much as the woman. So, you know, again, double standard. Um, I, I, I realized that I was a part of this machine, basically. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not cool with that. And I'm not going to go with that anymore. And um, so I'm not going to use those words. So now the only time that I would use the word bitch would be uh, 
Okay, so I don't quite have the language to describe this, but some of my closest friends are homosexual men. And in that culture, like that's that that culture, you know, like that bitch please. That is not offensive to me, at least. Maybe it is to other people. But using it in that context and like, bitch, I've been doing this for so long, whatever, you know, like that is reclaiming the word in a lot of ways. You know, it's like owning it. It's kind of like when African American people were being called boy all the time to degrade them. And then they started calling each other man. And that's supposedly where, where, you know, our use of the word man came from. Like, hey man, how's it going? Um, that that was, you know, within their culture, a way of negating the degradation that they were receiving and uplifting themselves in their community. And so I see, you know, bitch in that context as reclaiming it. I do not see the point in shaming anyone for their sexual choices. Like, slut, whore, all that stuff. And the fact that we, we we have the need to like say a man whore instead of just saying he's a whore, like, I don't know. All of that stuff, I just, I got to a point where I'm like, I just, I don't care what people do in private, they can do in private. Again, like I said, so long as no one's being hurt or abused, whatever. <laughs> if it's consensual, go with it. Um, try to be safe out there, protect yourself. And um, I guess that's that's all I have the right to say, really. Um, but yeah, I I um, realized that that's a change I can make in my life, which I did. And you know, it's something that I try not to police other people for because they have different a different moral compass that they live with, you know. But every once in a while, if someone's like, oh she's such a bitch. She, she said, um, something that I didn't like. It's like, well, why can't she just be an idiot? Why can't she be a butthole? Because we all have buttholes, you know? And that's, and I will say though, I am totally guilty of using the word dick. Like I will say, he's a dick. And I realize that's not cool because that's the same thing. That's like a part of anatomy that, um, you know, in the cis def definition belongs to someone born male. Um, so I don't, I don't have one. And it's not fair for me to be using a piece of male anatomy and like, and, and using, weaponizing it, but I still do it because it's so ingrained in my culture and all the guys around me use it. They don't see a problem with it. So every once in a while I'll bring it up, but for the most part, I still fall into that trap. That's something I've got to grow out of because, um, because it's not fair. And if I want to live in a world that, you know, has more equal opportunities for everyone, it goes both ways. Um, that brings me to kind of where I am in my feminist journey, I guess, which is that I see, um, a lot of the work that needs to be done needing to be done with men. And I, I see in a lot of ways men don't um, have an arena to grow in this capacity because most men's movements, let's be honest, are sexist, like the incel stuff, like most of them are women hating, women shaming, I can't get laid, I, I hate them all things. Um, but, but there is a lot of growth that needs to happen in our societal and gender expectations on men. You know, there was all this kerfuffle earlier in the month about um, toxic masculinity when the American Psychiatric Society came out, or association, I think, came out with, um, you know, outlining parts of masculinity that are toxic. Dear. Sorry, my camera just randomly stopped recording. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, elements of masculinity that were deemed to be toxic um, caused this huge uproar because I think a lot of people didn't understand that no one was saying that masculinity was inherently bad or that being male or being a man was bad or that traditional male gender roles even are bad, but that there are aspects of them that are harmful and that repress men and damage their relationships with each other and with women and with their kids and with the world. Um, and just like, for women, um, you know, if I want to go into like a, what's a traditional female gender definition? 
um, you're, you're, you're physically beautiful, you dress nicely, you um, love to cook, you love to provide for your family, you want children, you, um, you know, if we're going back, back, you serve the man. And of course, much of that has changed because of pushback. And parts of that definition are beautiful and parts of it are toxic to people. Like I said before, if that is what you want and that fits with your cultural values, that's great. But don't impose those on others. Um, and if you're a woman who does not want kids, maybe maybe you're gay, maybe you um, want something completely different out of life, then you should be free to pursue that and not be chastised and shamed and kind of beaten into a corner for it. And the same goes for men. So many of our societal issues, I feel like, stem from the fact that we socialize males to not express themselves. And we teach them from a young age that the only emotion that it's okay to share with the world is anger. You know, like all this, be a man, man up, boys don't cry. Um, all of that is, I would call that toxic masculinity because I think anything that is limiting and shortchanging and harming people is where, you know, it falls into the toxic category. So all that report was saying was that there are aspects of our traditional definition of masculinity that are harmful. Um, people got up in arms about it because they, they didn't understand that, that difference and they thought it was like, oh, masculinity is harmful, men are the enemy, um, which is not true at all. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at in my like feminist journey is um, there's still a lot of work we need to do as women and for ourselves, but I, I see, you know, it can't be in a vacuum. It can't be alone. Um, you know, I've heard the argument that if we label something's women's issues, it gives anyone of another gender uh, permission not to listen, even if it's subconscious, not, you know, permission because it's like, oh, well, that doesn't pertain to me. So, okay, I'll, I'm kind of intellectually interested or not interested at all, but that's for you guys. Like, but I think that um, it needs to be much more inclusive and we need to be looking at, you know, it even comes down to like, all of my education growing up was about safety was how not to get raped. Instead of don't rape. Well, not, I mean, women, women do rape, but not as often as men. But, but, you know, that's like the basic example of like, let's teach men not to rape rather than just how to defend yourself. Um, and that's a good start, but like I said, there's a lot more that can be done um, to help lift men up and give them, you know, the level playing field that we preach about because, you know, there are higher rates, I think, of male suicide um, than there are of, of women and there's a lot of men who succumb to addiction and to mental illness and there's a bigger stigma on men with mental illness than there is on women. There's a lot of challenges that are unequal that they face that, um, you know, we've broken those barriers. So they're in a sticky situation right now because they can't be like, well, let's have a men's movement because that will be seen as, you know, um, somehow anti-women or something. I don't know. I just don't, I don't really see that being a safe option. So I think that it's, it's important that we acknowledge that side of the coin and that side of the equation and the fact that we are all in this together and equality means lifting everyone up. Um, so through my work, I feel like these values have come into play. I think that, um, every story I write has an element of this just because it's an element of me just like my environmentalism and my love of nature shines through in most of my writing, so too do I believe that um, my beliefs in equality show up. So that's my way of kind of putting those ideas out there. It goes back to James Cameron and how he said like through a story, through that emotional investment and in character, you can change the world in a way. And if you're doing it person by person, introducing them to these ideas, then more power to you, you know? And if, if, if you're exposing people to, you know, maybe people are living really sheltered lives and a book, a book is their only way to, to see what's out there in the world. Um, just make sure it's always coming from a place of, of goodness inside you and, and it's art and it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> So that said, um, 
you know, I mentioned I had other ones of her books. I'm not saying anything against the rest of her books. It's just by the time I was going to read them, I had come to that realization of, ooh, this is damaging my daily life. Um, and I don't want to be angry all the time. There you go. He's neat. She's neurotic. This is fun. Yeah, I, I definitely still recommend her books. If you can read this stuff, which I probably can now without being triggered, like my younger self would be just pissed off. I can probably read it now and just intellectualize it and internalize it and think about it and mull it over. Um, so go ahead and look them up. Again, her name is Jessica Valenti. And as far as I know, feministine.com is still around. Um, yeah, so that brings me to the end of today's topic. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, feel free to comment below. And um, if you have other suggestions for topics, go ahead and, and leave them in the comments or message me. I'm all over social media. Just Google k.m.rice and you'll find me on Twitter, Instagram, a little bit on Tumblr. Most of my posts are just being pushed on Tumblr, though. I don't actually check Tumblr that often. Um, Facebook. I'm on Facebook a lot. So those are places you can find me, and obviously here on YouTube. <laughs> and yeah, thank you again so much for watching and for your support. Thank you to my patrons. You guys are absolutely amazing. And thank you always to my readers. Um, I have a announcement, an announcement. Um, my book, Ophelia, Afterworld Book One. This is obviously, <laughs> this is obviously a, a paperback. Um, a physical copy, but it also exists as an ebook, and its previous price was $9.99, but now it has been lowered to $5.99. So if you, um, if the price has been barring you from getting a hold of that ebook, um, have a look, see if this lower price entices you. And um, also on that note, I have a short story available for free. It is called The Walkers in Darkness and it is set in the Anglo-Saxon realm of old, where if you know me, I got very immersed in that period of history. I learned Old English. Well, not learned it. You can't really learn a dead language, but I studied it and I translated Beowulf. Um, it's, it's a place where my imagination really likes to play. So that um, short story, The Walkers in Darkness, is available um, for you to read for free. And I'll put the link to that in the description below. And it's just a little gift to you and to anyone else you think might be interested in my writing. Feel free to pass it around as much as you want. All right, guys. Thank you very much. It is time for me to sign off. So I'm signing off with this really cute little house that my sister actually got for me from my favorite store. The Dollar Store. Actually known as Dollar Tree, but... I'm not joking, it's my favorite place to go. Like, my motto has become, check the dollar store first. Crafting, arts, um, candles, like, almost anything, check the dollar store first. And you'll find stuff there that is three, is the same product, but it's three times the price at the drugstore. Just saying. The sun is starting to peek out, it's getting really bright, I'm getting like, I'm like half whited out, so. <laughs> For me and my cool Middle Earth shirt, from OSHA and my uh, little welcome house, little fairy garden cabin. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful 2019. Thank you for sticking around and for joining me on this journey and I'll see you next time. Bye.